you are worthy. Oh, yes, you are worthy. You are worthy to be praised. We give you glory, Lord God. We give you honor because you deserve it. We worship you because you are God. We worship you because you created us. We worship you because, Lord God, you're always there when we call upon you. We thank you. We glorify you, Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for being our Savior. Thank you for being our Lord. Thank you for being our friend. Thank you for being there when we needed you. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for drying our tears. Thank you for changing our life, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God, for your salvation. Thank you for your son that died on the cross of Calvary. Thank you for your deliverance, Lord God. Thank you for the gospel that penetrates our heart. Thank you for the transformation, Lord God, that you have done. I glorify you, I praise you, and I worship you today because you are worthy to be praised. I stand before you, Lord God. I am your vessel. I am your mouthpiece. Speak to me, Lord God. Show me what I need to say. Anything that you see, Lord God, that needed to be added, anything at all, I pray. May you use me. May you speak through me so they may know. They may be educated and they may be edified and they could come out here, Lord God, as a changed person. We thank you. We praise you. It's in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. And the church says, amen. God is good all the time. Pas jamais oublier bon Dieu bon. Na mauvais circonstance, na bon circonstance, bon Dieu toujours. Ou gen travail ou pa gen travail, bon Dieu toujours. Pas jamais oublier ça. We we papier bilio. Ou gen pil tèt chargé ou gen pil problème. Ou gen problème nan fami a, men pa jamais oublier. Bon Dieu. God is good. As I say, this is not something I say just out of routine. It comes from my experience with God. I know why I say God is good. Just the mere fact of standing up here when I know I don't deserve it, God is good. Because his son died for me on the cross and I'm able to receive salvation, I could say God is good. Don't ever forget that. I want to continue speaking to all of you about what we were discussing last Sunday. We are a church that is meant to last. And any attack that come against us, we can withstand it. We have talked about how we can withstand it, our unity, us not disconnecting ourselves, but us remaining in. This is how we can move forward. This is how we can grow. But I also felt the need to speak to you about the standard of the church family, the missions, the goals, the rules, the principles that exist in the church family. And I said, as I said to you last Sunday, it is important for a family, a blood-related family, to have family meetings from time to time. And when we have the family meetings, it should not only be when there's an issue. Or family meeting is going to look as if it's a punishment or a horrible time. When there's an issue, we definitely need a family meeting. But even when there's no issue, we still need a family meeting. Why? Because every member of the family have to be refreshed or we told certain principles and rules that, are, that exist in the family. Why? So that each family member do not continue to do their own thing, but we continue to work as a team and we move forward as a team. So 
when we have family meeting, and I'm still talking about blood-related family, we need to take time to discuss our principles, our rules. One thing I told you that my mother stressed on her kids, don't ever forget your family. No matter how old you are, don't forget your family. Always remember them. Anytime that you can help out the family, go ahead and do so. And she goes on and on and letting us know the principles and the rules. And these are things that needs to be said from time to time. Not only to young people, when you have young kids, five or six years old. Many times it needs to be said, especially during the teenage years. And teenagers tend to forget their family and more look upon outside friends. Now, there's nothing wrong with having friends and, and, and spending some time with your friends and having a good time. But you cannot forget the family or you cannot abandon the family and you just stick with friends. Are you with me? It still also needs to be reminded when they are young adults, 19, 20, 21 years old. Now you have authority to begin to start your life. You can start your life. You can start your career. You can start, uh, you can have a place. You can, uh, rent a, you can have a car. You can have a house. You are of age. You can get married. You can have kids. But even though you are starting your life, don't forget the family. When this is not done from time to time, what end up happening is members within the family continue to concern about their own thing. My career, my job, what I would like to do, where I would like to live. And then we are not concerned about the family. It is similar when a blood-related family have family meetings. At the church family need to have family meetings at the same time. And we need to be reminded of our principles, our rules, our standard, which is based on the word of God. We need to be reminded of that. Why? So the members within the church family do not think that we just come here to sit down, be entertained, hear a nice, uh, nice singing and, and a nice word of God, and then I go home. Then there won't be any love that exists in the family. You see, the word of God condemned the world, and it says that from the world, there won't be love that the way that it used to exist. Uh, the word of God says in Timothy that in the last days, people will be lovers of them. Who are you? Why should I care about you? It's about me. You do you, and I do. You see the world? That's the world standard. You see, now, if we don't have family member, I mean, fam not family members, if we don't have family meaning, now that same principle that exists in the world, you do you, I do me, will seep into the church family, and now we begin to exist as if we, we are just members coming in to sit in a bench, be entertained, go home, I don't need to care about you, you don't care about me. As long as I shake your hand and say, God is with you, God bless you, and then I go home, I'm good. Our, our relationship is deeper than that. When we have that kind of relationship, a hand shaking and smiling and said, how you doing? I'm doing okay, you doing all right? Okay, have a good week. When we have that kind of relationship, we cannot move forward as a church family. 
because God is good and God is gracious and God is merciful, he will, there will be sparks within the church family. That means good things will begin to happen to in this individual, that individual, and you will hear testimony from this and God delivering this person and that person. But it's not, God says, it's not just about delivering an individual. He wants to deliver the entire church family. He wants to move forward with the entire church family. It's not just one person receiving the Holy Ghost or receiving the, the calling or are blessed. He wants to bless the entire church family. And we got to be able to move forward together. Ha. Ephesians chapter 4. Um, if I would read, I'll read the whole chapter. But for the sake of saving time, please do me this favor. Open to Ephesians chapter 4. I want you to check to make sure what I'm saying is the truth. Ephesians chapter 4. As I'm beginning to explaining, uh, please check, review, and let me know if I am telling you the truth. Ephesians chapter 4 talks about unity within the body of Christ. It talks about unity within the church. It talks about unity within the church family. That's what it talks about. It begins to give a standard for our church family. This is how the church family should exist. Not like the world. Not the handshake, not the smile, and we go home. But we move forward together. We praise God together. We worship God together. We read the scriptures together. We are blessed together. We are delivered. Isn't that what the Israels is doing? Look back in the Old Testament. Isn't that what they were doing? From time to time, what would they do? Everybody in the village would come and meet at the temple courts to do what? What would they meet at the temple courts? To do what? So that the Pharisees can do what? They begin to read the scriptures to them. Why they were reading the scriptures? They were reminding them of who God is. Reminding them of what God has done. Reminding them of the standard they need to live. They had their church family meeting. But all of a sudden, now in 2021, we become too busy. We so isolated, isolated. We allow technology to isolate us. I can't visit you anymore. It's just give you a text. It's just do this. But we don't come together anymore. Okay, yes, there's a pandemic. I'm not going to forget that. But that's not an excuse for doing that before the pandemic. And it's definitely not going to be an excuse to continue to do it after the pandemic. We got to move forward together. So here's the rules. Here's the standard of the church family. Now, because I'm doing a comparison between blood-related and church fam family. Let's go to blood-related family first. The principles and rules that are in a blood-related family start from the head. It starts from the husband and wife. This is why when the husband and wife get together, before they get married, and I stress again, what do I stress? Before they get married, they sit down and begin to talk about these rules and principles. What I like, what I don't like. What I expect or what I need from the relationship, what's going to break down the relationship. And again, I stress, before you get married. Now, when that conversation happened after you get married, it's not that you can't have the conversation after. It's just that after you put the ring on the finger and you made the promise that I'm gonna be with you through thick and thin, now when you're discussing about these qualities and, 
and wounds, the person's going to say, wait a minute, I didn't know that. I didn't know that I had to do this. I didn't know this is what you expect. I didn't know this, that, that. I didn't know. I didn't know. And the ring is already on the finger. So that makes it an issue or creates an issue in the marriage. But when it's done before, see, I'm about to enter a promise before. In a relationship, I am um, expecting respect. Communication, honor. This is one thing that I like or don't like. A husband and a wife need to discuss that. After they come up with these principles and rules, these principles and rules seep down into the family, down to the kids. Husband and wife respect each other. Now they can tell the kids, listen, your brother is older than you. There's a reason that God created your brother before you. He have a responsibility to protect you. Listen to your older brother. Respect that. Now, when you tell your kids that, the kids also have to see that in the married couple. They have to see that from their mom and their dad. You want us to respect each other. Well, I'm going to look upon you and your wife or your wife and your husband, and I'm going to see if you respect each other too. You say that when we argue, we, we have a misunderstanding. We got to work it out. You are brothers and sisters. Okay, so now I'm going to watch. When mommy and daddy have an argument, do they work it out? Parents have to reflect the principles that they require from their kids so that the kids now can begin to live up to the principles that they have instructed the kids to do. Similarly, in a church family, now the principles come from the word of God and now the leaders, which is the head of the church. Well, okay, let me make that slight correction. Christ is the head of the church. We got to stay biblical. And Christ placed the leaders to lead the church. But the leaders got to reflect the principles that's in the word of God. So that now the church family members can reflect that principle. Are you with me? In other words, what I'm trying to say, what I'm about to tell you, as I explain you the standard, the standard is first for the leaders, then it's for the church members. Are you with me? If you look at Ephesians chapter 4, it let us know, let's look at the second part of Ephesians chapter 4 first. It let us know in Ephesians 4, verse 17 to 32, it let us know how we ought to live together as a church family. And this is what's gonna make us different from the world or from any other kind of relationship. Number one, it says that yes, we may be, um, God has taken us from being Gentiles, but we should no longer live as if we are Gentiles. In this family, you should put off falsehood. People that are acting fake in this church family, it should not exist. It says that in this church family, we ought to speak truthfully. Not in lying to each other. It says that in our anger, because it knows that at times we may be anger, angry, but in our anger, do not sin. Don't allow anger to control you and make you do something that is sinful. In fact, the Bible says, don't even let the sun go down while you still have your anger. 
And there's something I have to say on this because I'm talking about family and I'm talking about church family too as well. Now, if you look in Ephesians chapter 4, it does says that. Don't, don't let your anger, right? Um, don't let you be angry while the sun is setting down. In other words, it's saying you have to deal with the anger and deal with it quickly. But there's time when we look at this verse, a lot of people think that, well, I have to deal with the anger in the same day. And this is where mistake happen because we can have misunderstanding and, ang and people within the family can be angry at each other. But it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to deal with it the same day. I want you to imagine this. You have two people that's angry. When you're angry, the very most important, the, the thing that you're focusing on most of the time is to vent. I'm explaining myself why I'm angry. I'm not in the mood to listen. I'm just venting. You take two angry people, place them in the room, and what do you have? <laughs> Chaos. So some people take that verse and they think, okay, I have to deal with the anger now, today, right now. Sometimes there's some issues, there's certain things that are done within the family or within, within the blood-related family or within the church family that is not going to be handled in one day. Everybody needs to calm down first. Or when we sit together, we're not going to come with a resolution. We're going to come with complaining. We're going to come with arguments. And nothing get resolved. Certain times, certain issues that occur, we cannot handle it the same day. We need everybody to calm down. After you calm down, now we sit together and we start talking. Talking. Not arguing. Not yelling, but talking. But a lot of people think it's just one day. We have to be careful for that. It continues to say that we should not steal. In this church family, we do not steal from each other. In fact, it says, if you, what you ought to do is you ought to work. Work and earn some money so you could buy possession for yourself. There's no stealing in this, in this church family. It continued to say, don't let any unwholesome talking language come out of your mouth. Words that are going to destroy people. Words that's profanity. Words that's going to cause a more, more division instead of unity. But allow words that's going to build up the other to come out your mouth. This is the standard we ought to live by. And we cannot forget that. Just because a situation occurred or just because something happened, now we forget that standard. Hold on to that standard. Ephesians 4, the first part, verse 1 to 16, it let us know that we should not forget our church family. Invest in our church family. Invest in our church family. Don't forget it. If you look from verse 1 to 16, it says that the Holy Spirit gives you, each and every one of us, a spiritual gift. Why did he give us a spiritual gift? Is it to make you prideful? Is it to make you feel as if you are better than everybody else? Is it to make you popular? Look in Ephesians 1 verse 16. It says, take your spiritual gift 
and invest it in the church. If it's hospitality that you can do, take your hospitality talent and invest it in the church. We want people to welcome our guests. We want people to welcome our church members. Come, be an usher. If it's preaching that you can do, go ahead and preach. We want people, our church members, to hear the word of God. We want people outside to hear the word of God. Invest in the church. If your talent is musician, go ahead. God bless you with a talent for you to sit in front of an instrument and then you learn it and you learn it so quickly and you're blessing others. Take that talent and invest it in the church. Why should we invest in the church? Because the church need to advance together. It's not just you need to multiply your talent and you know how to play every single instrument, five, six, seven, eight instrument, but take somebody from the church, sit with them, treat, teach them what you know so they can invest in the church. Whatever you can do, invest it back in the church. Why? So the church can move and advance together. Ma fini avec ça. Avec ma dina créole, avec anglais. Parce que semaine passée, um, okay, Pastor Daniel, our new member, um, te prêché sur Dean, right? Avec dit commencer à expliquer pour que ça soit important pour Biden. Il commence à expliquer ça. Moi, je suis dans ma propre note. Moi, écrit note je. Moi, je dis, oh, bon Dieu, regardez. Même ça, les prêcher, c'est dans la même ligne au bon message, moi. Do you know what dim is? Ou quand est-ce que ça dim y do you know what pain ties mean? I'm going to explain this semaine passé. But I'm going to explain in Creole. I'm going to explain in English today for the young people. Um, paying your thighs is actually an investment in the church. If I want young people to understand the importance of paying your thighs. It is as if your parents, right, they did everything for you. They took care of you. They protect you. They give you clothes. They send you to school. They, uh, you have a place to stay. If you want something, they buy it. They give you food. Now you're old enough. You're 22, you're 21, and you're old enough to work. You go and you work, and you receive a paycheck. It is as if your parents tell you, that I know you are working now. I'm not asking you for all your paycheck. But can you give me 10% of your paycheck so that you can help us with our endeavors or our issues? We've been helping you and protecting you all your young years. Now God give you the opportunity for you to get a job and you're earning a paycheck. When you earn a paycheck, you're still living in the house. Pay something, help us out somehow, so the family can advance. Before we have to bear with the bills, the house by ourselves, uh, uh, the light by ourselves. But by the grace of God, he gave us kids. Our kids are healthy. You grow up, you go to school, you earn a paycheck now. Can you please help us with some of the money? So why? So the family can advance. This is what ties is. You helping your church family to advance. When you pay your thighs, you are investing. So not only do we invest with our spirit, 
but we should invest with our money. You investing in the church so that the church can advance. And he said one thing and then I'm gone. That is very important. A lot of people, they will give to other churches and not to the local church that they go to. So that young people can understand what he mean by that. Give it to other churches. There's nothing wrong with that. You kidding me? Other churches is part of the body of Christ too. But when you abandon your church, it is as if you abandon your family and then you helping another family. Your parents are having issues with their bills. You live in the house, you earn a paycheck, and you give your parent no money, but you're giving another family money. This is what you're doing. When you take your thighs and you pay it to another church, you're helping another church family, this is good, but you are abandoning your own church family where God has placed you in. Are you with me so far? So when now you pay your thighs, it should not be with anger. It should not be because somebody begged you. You kidding me? You are investing back in the church family so the church family can advance. When the church family advance, you advance. I really hope you understand that. This is the standard that we ought to live. There's more. We'll speak about it later. But this is some of the standard. And sometimes we need to be reminded of that. Because members will go astray and do their own thing. And they will completely forget about the church family. And now we cannot advance. May God bless you.